my official name is uh, Cal Pan, first name K-A-L, last name P-H-A-N. Uh, if you're interested in my Mian name, my, in the Mian tradition, we have uh, three names. Uh, my given name was Kao uh, Ta Sepan, or Pian Kao Ta in Mian. And then I also have an adult name that was uh, designated by a generational name. It's uh, uh, Sang Tin, Pian Sang Tin. Pian is, uh, stands for Pan or Se Pan in Mian. And the Se Pan, Se is what the Thai government added that. Well, it is a uh, prefix that was uh, given to Mian primary, but including a number of the uh, ethnic minority uh, origin from China, because in Mian, if you to write Mian name in Chinese, uh, that would be uh, off really relate, relate, related to related to uh, uh, Chinese ancestry, and that's how they say it came to be. My recollection of Laos is uh, limited to. Uh, uh, my first, I, I grew up in Laos my first 10 years. Uh, when I was born uh, at the age of one, my family was forced to relocate from northern province of uh, Nam Tha, which is a uh, bordering China, uh, Yunnan province. At that time, the communists had taken over. Again, as one year old infant, I had little understanding, but from what my parents told me, that we had to escape to safety near the Golden Triangle, uh, just across from the Burma and Thailand border, uh, almost at the tip of the Golden Triangle. Uh, it was there that I uh, remember what it was like in Laos growing up. In the traditional Mian society, uh, for us especially, we uh, originally located to the Mekong um, river on the lowland, what we call flatland. There, it was a different environment where me and we used to farm in the hill. Now, suddenly, they're in the lowland. And my family also, in addition to that, because in the lowland with the um, mosquito, which was a, a, a difficult thing to deal with in, 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 in a world where medical help was not available, and that's why my younger sister, she came into contact with malaria and passed away. My family ultimately, after a brief time, they moved up back into the mountain. In current American time and space, it was short distance, probably no more than 15, 20 miles away. But in terms of walking, there was a, quite a, a walk to the mountain where we ultimately settled and where I grew up. Uh, from 1966 until about 75. The, um, it, my recollection would be primarily from that period when we would uh, practice traditional farming. Uh, we had two villages that we set up. One is your primary home village, and another one is for your what we call field village, where you would actually farm. We practice um, slash and burn agriculture. Uh, this is traditional practice that uh, many, most of Mian people have uh, grown accustomed to because of our prior history in China, where we were forced to um, uh, migrate to the mountain where the land was uh, le least hospitable. And through centuries, we have uh, gone accustomed to that practice, so we moved to the mountain to practice that. Um, in that particular type of indigenous society, medical um, um, health system, educational system, modern convenience such as electricity, uh, we had none. Stores, shops, we had none. So uh, as a child, my, my childhood memory primarily is on how to be a farmer. Um, I spend a lot of my time at uh, younger years with my grandma, taking care of what, staying with my grandma in the main uh, home village. At other time, as I got a bit older, five, six years old, if I remember six or six, seven years old, I, uh, during that time, I would uh, take care of my uh, younger siblings, my sisters. Um, and you also go out to the field watching 
your parents to learn how to uh, be a farmer, the skills. As a kid, the first level of learning out in the field would be to learn how to cut down the smaller trees and branch or brush. In, in that society, the men are, pro are responsible for cutting down the trees, the big trees with ax. And after that's been felled, then the rest of the um, family members would help out with cutting down things like bamboos and smaller trees and you let it dry before you burn it so you could farm it. After you burn it, you have to do what we call clearing. You will clear because the fire does not usually burn all the uh, trees and branches, so you have to cut them down into smaller pieces and you will bring them home as firewood and then the field will be cleared and you can begin farming. Uh, during the farming process, uh, again, lacking the modern technology is a manual labor-intensive job where a child, in my case, I would have to learn how do you plant a, uh, rice, how do you plant, plant corn. So I would be like assistant to my parents at other time at home when I'm not out there with uh, my parents, I would be uh, uh, taking care of my younger siblings. So one of my fondest, uh, most memorable uh, time was um, it, it, when I was taking care of my younger sister at a field. And that's uh, uh, almost a, an hour walk away from my, my village. In Mian uh, stories, we had limited contact with the lowland people. And there were stories of uh, lowland people who were cannibals. Uh, dangerous people because we in Mian culture you have a in a Mian language it was very specific people who belong to Mian uh, ethnicity we call ourselves Yu Mian or Mian but anyone else who's not a Mian we call Jian so it's a rest specific name if it's uh, American Jian American if it's Thai Jian Thai Chinese Jian Ke so that prefix is to identify non-Mian person, and that uh, alienation word makes it uh, very fearful. And so one day while me and my sister were in, in the hut, while my parents were working down in the field, uh, there were non-Mian people, Jian, coming up. And we thought they were gonna, going to come and kidnap us because there were stories about uh, Jian kidnapping Mian kids. I took my sister and we ran down the hill and it turned out that we were just uh, rolling down the hill. We were too young, both of us. Um, so that was my learning experience, how to take care of kids and out in the field, helping my parents. Um, and obviously at the end of the war, uh, 1975, my first memory of uh, the war was when one day a group of uh, several soldiers came into the village and the thing that I remember the most was um, one of the soldiers carry a bazooka. <clears throat> because the bazooka has a very unique shape, it looks like the banana um, flower, or the, 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 I'm not sure exactly what term it is. It's the banana, before it becomes banana, the, uh, the tip of the banana flowers. And a later time, they would have a performance in our village singing some of the songs about being unity in Laos and we would go watch. So those were my first encounter with the uh, communist soldiers. My, as a, as a, a, a child, my parents did not uh, express the fear or the concern to me. Uh, as a child, you, you learn the skills, live, live the way your parents asked to live. So I, I really didn't know or have any fear of the communists. Uh, uh, it wasn't until much later when I understood the meaning of a fear of a communist. Uh, at that time, all the plan that my parents were making about the escape and all those things, they did not disclose to me. Well, we live just across the Mekong River, but Mekong River represents a genuinely serious uh, obstacle because it was the one of the largest river we had ever encountered with. Uh, from my field village to the Mekong River, the walk's about two hours or so. It's, uh, we were on the uh, 
top of the mountain and walking down all the way to the, uh, to the lowland, to the river. The, we, it took us three times to escape because the first time we uh, went down to, again, one day they just said, okay, we have to leave. So we, we, again, in the society we were in, we didn't have all the properties that we do here. We didn't have cars, we didn't have all kinds of uh, kitchenettes and you know, closet things like we didn't have things of that nature. So we had very few things to pack up. We, it was in the evening, late in the evening, evening. We walked all the way down to the shore and waited uh, for the boats to come pick us up. Uh, my dad and my uncle were two of the person that were taking the lead for about 30, 40 people in our groups. Some of the villagers, you know, they were not leaving with us. We were one of the group that wanted to leave first. When we went down there uh, near the shore, we went into the hiding and behind the um, bamboo, um, uh, behind a, a bunch of bamboos, a forest there. And on the radio, the boat operator stated that they saw way too many flashlights on the shore. Those were communist soldiers and they were not going to come pick us up. Uh, having heard that, um, we all of us decided to walk again back to the mountain and went back to the village as if nothing happened. Then at a later time, and I cannot uh, recall exactly how much longer, but not too long they organized another one. This time we went down there again in the same uh, spot because there's only one trail that goes to the shore where there weren't soldiers. A little bit up through the, uh, uh, up there would be a village where there were soldiers, down a little bit there were, so this is a section where it's uh, in the pitch dark area with no uh, house or village. We went down there, we, uh, they made a contact with the boat operator again. They mentioned that, okay, we let the boat drift over, but we drifted down too far because the boat would come from the Burmese side of the uh, river. They couldn't have the engine on. With the engine on, the communists would have heard the sound. So they would go up the river, let the boat drift across. Uh, with our uh, lights to tell them where the spot was, they drifted down too far. So they said we had option. Either they start the engine and we would uh, get out or we would have to go back. And after uh, having some discussion, my, the leaders of the group, including my father and my uncle, decided that it would be safer for us to go back to the village. As we walked back to almost near the edge of the village, there's some, um, some of the, one of the villagers came out and warned us, you cannot go in the village. The people who escorted you to the uh, river, they all been arrested, tied up in the village. So this is almost 9, 10 at night. Uh, the only option was for us to walk back to our home village, which is about two, three hours away. So I was again about 10 years old. We, we had no choice, but uh, it was a memorable, difficult experience, uh, even to this day, and to walk to the home village where we uh, found safety. The third time, finally, this is the time that um, perhaps um, I remember the most because my uncle came home to my uh, home village where I was playing with a friend and staying with my two grandmas from my maternal and paternal grandmas. Uh, me and people live in extended family uh, 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 home, family structure. We have extended family structure. And my uncle told me, um, son, you need to uh, go, where are your grandparents? I said, they went out to another village to get some indigo we use indigo um, to dye our clothes, in the mean uh, traditional uh, clothes. And he said, okay, you have to go get them home because your aunt is really sick. So not knowing what the plan was, he didn't tell me because he feared that I would uh, tell other people along the way. So me and my friend, we walk almost uh, 30, 40 minutes away, um, possibly longer because we had to go up, uh, up in the hill mountain and down the other side where we, I told my grandmas that they had to go home because my aunt was really sick in the field village. 
not knowing that we were planning to escape, they actually carried uh, all this indigo uh, liquid with them all the way home. And when we came home, my uncle said, okay, we have to pack and go. And um, so we just packed quickly and took off into the jungle. And we walked uh, until we got up to the top of the mountain. Uh, we rested and walked down to the other side of the mountain. This is about three, four hours walk. Uh, and we came upon a Mian village. They put us into the back of the uh, house in the traditional Mian house. There's a wall separating the living quarter and the bedrooms in the back. We were hiding there in case the communists would come in, the soldiers. And then my uh, uncle um, asked one of the young men of the house to go look for my father who escorted the other group of uh, our uh, villagers from the field village because my uncle was taking the group from the home village and the other one's a field village. He went up there, he noticed that there were some new uh, footprints there from soldiers and he tried to uh, give a signal for my father to come out by whistling but my father did not come out. So he thought that the soldier had uh, frightened my da a dad the group to uh, move back to the village. He came back down, this is already dark. And my uncle decided he would go give it one more try. He went up there uh, and uh, uh, called out for my dad through the um, whistling signal. And then my dad came out. And then finally we got together and walked down the, uh, toward the um, river. And because it's in, and this is the time I also remember the most because it was so dark. And we had to walk with our flashlight along the, along the uh, uh, little creek. My dad was in the front, he had a flashlight, followed by me and another fr a friend of mine, and then uh, the rest of the group in the back. My dad would uh, fla flash the light so he could see where he was walking, then turn it off. And I was just following him, and that's how we walked. We couldn't have the flashlight on. You flash it on, off, on, off, just so that you could walk enough, and when you can't see, you flash it on. When we got down to the spot where we were hiding before, uh, they had the radio and again they drifted too far but this time they decided you know what this is the third time we have to uh, make some decision we're, we're, we're gonna take the risk so they start the engine we could hear it rolling they said to come down to the shore and as soon as we get there you jump in and so when they got to the shore it was two boats tied together to form one boat we had uh, close to 30 40 people so we all jumped in the boat, and as soon as we crossed the middle part of the river, we could see the flashlight coming on on the shore across there. And the captain said that he was going to have to turn off the boat because they could still uh, reach us with this uh, bazooka, a shooting within the shooting range. So he turned off the boat and drifted into the Laos, uh, the Burma side of the river. And as he drifted down uh, farther, uh, he start up the engine again once we were in the safe distance. And he took us to the tip of the Golden Nut Triangle. It is a casino there now, but at that time it was just a farm. Um, they let us out and we had to walk to a, there's a field house there for the Thai. This is a Burma lowland farming, paddy rice field. They would have a little a uh, rest area for when, during the day would, when they uh, uh, need to rest. As we're walking through that rice field, I, what still lingers in my memory is that we have to walk through a type of uh, bush that's similar to a blackberry bush with a lot of thorns. And again, being from an indigenous society where we had little uh, financial resource to have the type of uh, clothes that we have in America here, I had a short and a t-shirt, so those thorns uh, really tore up my, uh, my legs. And so next morning when we woke up, when the uh, dew got on my legs, I still remember that uh, burning pain. And they left us there next morning, they came back, because on the other side of the uh, border between Thailand and Burma, there's another river. So we were in a position, no position to get to safety when they came back they demanded that we give them a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of money, being that we were um, indigenous people with uh, no uh, modern uh, capitalistic society 
um, we, we didn't have much. Um, they say you know, either you give us all the money or we will call the Burmese um, to come down, uh, pirates and uh, robbers. And we had no choice, gave them what we had, and then they took us across into the Thailand side of the uh, uh, border. And from there, they left us, and we walked up a very steep uh, tea plantation hill. Uh, after they walk for along up to the ridge of the mountain, they will walk along the ridge, and then we slowly descended to the lowland in the paddy rice field, and we came to a village, Thai village, where we, we were left in, in, in this, there was a little building that we were left there. It's a thatch roof building. And we waited for a while until a bus um, came and picked us up and took us to a refugee camp uh, in, the, in the one of the Thai town that just across from the, uh, uh, from the Lao Sai. We, in, in, in that first camp, it was a makeshift camp. It's on a hillside. They clear out some bamboos, and then everyone had to make their, make their own thatch roof uh, hut. In my family, we had, uh, see, we had 10, 11, 12 people in my family. And that little thatch roof uh, hut was um, no big, bigger than 20 by 20, I would say, and we all live in there. It's on a hillside, and there were those restrooms. So, most people will go up to the bush up in the top of the hill. And when it rained, you can imagine how difficult it was, but we all lived there. And that particular uh, camp was located next to a lake. And with the lake, with uh, mosquitoes and unsanitized living areas, many people died in that, in that camp. I mean, literally, we almost had a funeral almost every day. Uh, this is for a population no greater than 2,000 people there, but you had a lot of uh, funerals. And that's also where uh, one of my, gran my paternal grandma passed away. Um, she probably had appendicitis, we're not sure, but uh, she was taken to the uh, hospital where they said they couldn't do much, so they had to give her, actually they put her to rest with some kind of medication. Um, we stayed at village for almost six months. It, it was um, difficult. There were not enough food. There were really, you're, you're locked up in this uh, dirty, crowded place with nothing to do. We couldn't go to school. Although we see, I did see that there was a school just down the road for the Thai children, but we couldn't. Uh, it was during that camp that all my uncle uh, and his friend tried to make a living by going down to uh, different Thai farmers to buy um, vegetables to take back to the uh, camp to sell. Uh, those vegetables, I, I, I still remember, they called Pagat Dong, uh, some kind of bitter um, uh, vegetables. They brought it back. And for me, try to make some uh, money just to help out we would walk down to the Thai city that's called uh, Cheng San, which is right on the um, Mekong River um, shore. We would go help them um, get fetch water for the people who live there. Um, we have a, bu a bucket. You go down to the river, uh, fetch water, go up the, um, the shore, then to the um, it's very steep shore if you know the Mekong River, up to uh, the house that you put in a big uh, jar. And they put some kind of a pill in those jar and very soon the water clears up because the water from the Mekong River is very muddy. But when we put in those jar, they would put some kind of pill in it. I'm not sure what it was and it would clear up. So they would pay us to, to help them to get the water. And in that camp, we stayed there for like I said, six months then they finished building another camp that's uh, a little bit farther inland into Thai, it's called Chiang Kham Refugee Camp. The build, there were 43 buildings, see, 43 buildings. The buildings was, uh, the roof was, uh, it's like a military barracks. It's a nine, 18 rooms, nine on each side. 
Uh, it was partitioned by uh, particle boards, and the roof was um, with open, uh, the top between the rooms are open. So everyone, you know, if the, someone else lives on the other side, they talk, you could hear them. And the roof was made, made of aluminum roof. Uh, so you can imagine the heat during the, in this tropical uh, region in the, with the humidity is very hot. But within that, we, my family, because at that time my uncle's family, they were separated into another family. So my family, we had uh, uh, nine members at that time and we, uh, ha we had two rooms. Each room is probably uh, 10, 10 by 12 or 8 by 10. Uh, it wasn't that big, but well, that's how we uh, live in, in that camp and that was the first time that I had a chance to attend school. In, in that camp is surrounded by barbed wire with an uh, uh, entrance guarded by Thai uh, soldiers. Well, we, one, we were political refugees at the time. Um, the Thai government uh, again, uh, this is uh, something that obviously I learned uh, as an educator and as a, a scholar in this country, but there was a lot of political issues in Thailand at that time. They did not want any communists. There was a communist insurgency in the north and they were trying to contain also, but they did not want us to be part of a Thai people. So we were refugees and through refugee was provided funding through UNHCR, uh, provided funding to Thai government to create those camps to house all the refugees. So they did, the, in terms of Thai government, they did not want any refugees to go out of the camp to become part of Thai citizens. We were not Thai people. So they kept us in and kept others out. Inside the camp, um, um, but good thing is that that was the first time that they, uh, I had a chance to see a school because prior to that I had never had a pen or paper. Uh, so they had a makeshift uh, Thai language uh, primary school in, inside the camp there. So it was, um, for me, in a way I felt uh, that we had a chance to, to learn something. So I, 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 did, I did well in the camp considering the situation was. So in the three, four years there, after the third year, I completed a Thai refugee camp, fourth grade education. Uh, I was one of the first 23 um, children in the camp to complete that uh, uh, fourth grade in Thailand. Thai, obviously compared to today's um, American education, fourth grade that would be comparable to maybe first grade at best here. Uh, we were learning how to do um, uh, basic arithmetic up to a uh, fraction, um, that was it, not even addition, subtraction, but just basic understanding fraction. Uh, here you, you start learning that, I mean you are expert in that in first grade already. Uh, learning how to read and write Thai, and that was the extent of our education of refugee camp. But even though limited, we felt that we have gained a lot because prior to that, I had never had a chance to step inside a, a school before. It was difficult, whereas we were de independent people living in the, though it was to the American modern standards, we had a difficult life in the mountain because we didn't have medical facility, no education, no stores, no electricity, but we were free to live with minimal control or influence from the uh, government. We didn't have to pay tax, we farm wherever we choose, uh, we live as we saw fit. Um, we never have to be worried about being hungry as, as long as you're willing to work. Um, you live with part of nature. If you feel your farm in years when your farm is not productive, you still could depend on nature. And it was struggle, no doubt, but we were free to, to live the way we choose to. We were not dependent on anyone else. In the refugee camp, it was difficult because we are completely dependent on the food dis distribution 
that was given to the Thai authorities through UNHCR. Obviously, for every dollar that was uh, donated to support the refugees, only a fraction of it got to the re uh, refugees. And the type of uh, food that they gave to us at the, at the lowest um, quality. Example, the rice grains would be the ones all broken up that you usually use to feed the animals they gave to us. So we become very dependent and my parents weren't very happy. They, I mean, like all the parents, we wanted to be, our hope and dream was to go back to Laos. <clears throat> I mean, we didn't know what America was. We had, even though the CIA um, came to Laos and worked with a lot of Myanmar soldiers, we did not have direct contact with them, the villagers. Very few of the villagers had any association with the Americans. Uh, technically, through the uh, uh, secret war in Laos, they weren't supposed to be in Laos. They stationed in Thailand, and the one that was stationed in Laos, they were classified as a, a, civi uh, uh, um, a civilian working to help a, uh, the, the Laotians, not military personnel. So we didn't have any connection with the Americans. Um, so in the refugee camp that we became completely dependent. Uh, they have weekly distribution of food. Those are all the food we had. And with little money, little financial resource, we, 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 don't, we didn't really have opportunity to, to live a life fully enjoyable. At times, uh, some people in the refugee camp, including my father, trying to find a ways to supplement uh, food by uh, sneaking out of camp uh, at night. Uh, when you do that, if you get caught, they will punish you, make you do public work, or lock you up in jail in the camp. At other times, so some people uh, on the, uh, they would have a truck in Thailand. They call ship laws a ten wheelers, but here nowadays in America, you'd have those eighteen wheelers, the, the truck similar to that open uh, truck bed in the back. And they would come to the camp, and they would select the able bodies and men primarily, and they would put in the back there as if uh, people were um, uh, commodities, properties, and just load it up, and took us to the um, tobacco fields. And there they would uh, work in what I call tambom, uh, where you dry the tobacco. A, a, um, a building to dry tobacco, and they would tie the tobacco, tobacco leaves into bunches and then carry it up to the smokestack to dry them. And that's what, uh, how we earned some of the money. For me, I was, as soon as I could work, um, again, we, we tried to survive. I did a couple of things to, to supplement the family income. One was to go in those trucks to go out to the field. We were too little. I was too small to carry the sleeves to put in the climb the smokestacks. So they took us out to the field where the tobacco was growing. You would have a little bucket of yours to water the tobacco plants because they didn't have the irrigation system that we have in the America here. You have to go down the ditch, get, fetch water, walk along the road and water tobacco plants. And they would give you uh, 12 bots, if I remember, 10 or 12 bots. That's equivalent to 50 cents here at that time. At that time, you. Uh, uh, exchange rate was like 20 to 24 dollar a baht per dollar. So you get basically 50 cents a day. And to me, that was a lot at that time because you could buy candies and cupcakes uh, and a Coke. So that's how I used to work. And then at night, when um, I was 12 years old, get to 12, 13 years old, I, w I was a little bit older. All the camps at night, they require each uh, building. They, they, they go to building one, we have 43. And so depending how many people in each building, each family has to provide a person to go guard the camps. There were one, two, three, four, five, six, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, there's six entrance to the camp, and each entrance has to be um, guarded by three, two, uh, three uh, persons. 
So you go to start and it gets dark until the morning. So you divide the shift. And so I would, I would do that still my first time. I still remember we were guarding the front gate. And that's where they had the store. And they would have a platform about this high. I was a kid, so I fell asleep and fell down and, and woke up. My cheek was completely blue, uh, bruised. And um, later, um, I would help other people who it was their turn and they had more resource, they would pay me to take their spot. And that's how I also made uh, money to help out the family. But it was a struggle on daily um, to survive. Uh, at one time, my dad uh, uh, contemplated on uh, moving out of camp to settle in Thailand. He did go out uh, on the way back. He got caught and put in jail and then forced to do public work. But for them, it was, we had to go back, find a way to make a living because camp in the, uh, life in the camp was not that pleasant. For me as a child, having an opportunity, opportunity to attend school, to me, that was very fortunate things. I learned how to read and write. Um, it was more than what my previous generation could ever have had. Well, we were there from 1970. The first camp, we stayed six months in 75. Uh, after the, that camp, we stayed from 1976 to 1979, December uh, 1979. <clears throat> Although I was a child, I was, um, I somehow had a uh, very strong will, will and determination, I, I guess. My uncle, who was a, uh, my dad was a soldier, my uncle was, was a soldier, but my uncle was in higher rank. And so he was able to come to the United States in 1978 or 77, I can't recall exactly, but probably 78, and he was when he was applying to come to the United States. And the way they make determination to ask who would be able to come to the United States based on your military official rank. Uh, it was believed that if you were high ranking officials then you were at a higher risk if the communists should take over Thailand. So those people would have more chance of coming to the United States. If you didn't have any association with the military, military then you couldn't come. But almost every man were, you know, uh, was a soldier at one time or another, but my uncle was higher rank, so he was able to come. And when he was uh, able to come, I wanted to come. At that time, we have to understand that the men had no prior exposure to modern world, as I mentioned before. They didn't know the America, the United States, Europe, the con Africa. They had never seen an African-American person before. Or most of them had never seen a Caucasian person before. We didn't know that there's other world outside, uh, beyond where, where we were. We only knew China, Laos, Vietnam, Thailand, Burma. That was the extent of our knowledge of the world at that time. So we were afraid, not unlike the immigrants of uh, other immigrants group, one voluntary immigrants who wanted to come to America, me and people did not want to come to America. Absolutely, they did not want to come to America. They were so fearful Americans um, because Americans looked so different. The few that came to our camp were missionaries. Um, they were fearful because American hairy, big, tall, almost looked similar to one of the Mian folk tales of a cannibalistic people who were, we call them wild people that live in a, you know, unknown place with hairy body and big. So nobody wanted to come to America really at that time. Very few took. That's why in 19, the first me and family came here in uh, April 1976. Whereas, you know, Vietnamese and Lao and the Hmong have been to America before, um, me and people didn't want to come. The family came to uh, Michigan. The second family came in November 1976. That's how few we were. So, but for me, I, I wanted to come for some, whatever reason, I thought that that was my chance to have a better life. Because I, in, in reading Thai books, I read a little bit about America and the life about uh, uh, the world outside of the refugee camps. I wanted to come. But when we went to register, um, the, uh, they wouldn't let me come with my uncle because I, I, I had to stay with my parents. They said, if I didn't have a parent, 
Uh, I didn't have any parents. I was by myself, then they would let me come with my uncle, but I couldn't. So after my uncle came here, um, like I said, my dad tried to go out to a camp to live in Thailand, but it wasn't successful. He went out, came back, and then got caught, so that's really bad um, omen. So ultimately, in 1979, my uncle um, sponsored my family. This is part of resettlement in the United States, you know, it's uh, through the USCC, United uh, States Catholic Charities, you know, they do most of the churches, the Lutheran Church, uh, um, those organizations help facilitate the resettlement of refugees by finding sponsors. And through my uncle sponsored my, own, my family, he was in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, then he found out that there was another Mian family in Montgomery, Alabama, so he went down there. So he sponsored my family when um, my fi family's name fi finally came out. Must have been December 1st, 1979, because we stayed, in, after we, they took a bus, took our family down to Bangkok. We stayed at the rooftop of a hotel, a motel, for seven days before we were cleared to, they had to do medical clearance before we were cleared to come to the United States. We arrived in um, San Francisco on December 7, 1979. Um, speaking of war, you know, famous Pearl Harbor Day, we arrived here. And then we spent a night at the uh, travel lodge in San, near San Francisco airport before they took us down to Atlanta and then finally to Montgomery, Alabama, where my uncle picked us up. Yeah, see, interestingly, when we arrived in Alabama, see, we didn't have a birth certificate per se. We used a lunar calendar. Um, this is based on the moon, Chinese calendar, some people call them. But me and people use it, Chinese use it, Vietnamese use it. Um, I was uh, put as a, a, a year older than, because the calculation missed uh, interpretation of the uh, lunar calendar to Gregorian calendar, so I was put a year older. So when I in, ri arrived in Alabama, I was uh, 15 years old. And again, I was um, anxious to go to school, wanted to go to school. Um, uh, Alabama, there weren't that many Asians, uh, very few Asians. Um, my uncle um, took us to register for school in January because when we came, it was near the um, holiday already. And the principal asked what grade I was in in Thailand. Again, with little knowledge about the world that refugees, especially me and, and Mon came from, they thought we had a normal life, normal school. So my uncle asked me what grade. I said, well, Thai school, I finished fourth grade in the refugee camp. Uh, the principal asked, what about English? Well, my, in the camp, we had a paid school taught by people who barely knew the alphabets. So I finished what they call a book two. Basically, you just knew the alphabets. So he told the principal I finished book two. I guess the principal thought I had some learning disability. I mean, 15 years old, completing second grade, right? So they put me in the third grade, starting the second semester. It was a difficult experience, to say the least. Uh, and, and so I um, stayed in third grade for um, half a year. During the summer, they made me go fourth and fifth grade. Then following year, I was in the sixth grade. Um, I stayed in sixth grade for a year. Then my family uh, decided to move, move to California. Um, because Alabama was a difficult place to adjust to. As soon as you arrive there, the uh, refugee resettlement, uh, USCC, they provide a uh, small amount of funding to help you to s settle there. Initially, after uh, about six months, my, we had to get a job. With no prior educational experience or skills, my dad had to get a job, my mom had to get a job, so it was uh, very challenging uh, uh, to find a job uh, to, to be sustainable. So they, and plus, it was difficult to practice our traditional culture and religion. We had to move to places where 
uh, we had other Myanmar peoples and Richmond had a, a group of our relatives so we decided to move to Richmond and um, so when we moved to Richmond I um, I was put in eighth grade for about a month and they sent me to high school because I was too old I was driving already I was 16 years old officially um, as an eighth grader so I started uh, Richmond High School. Uh, some of you may have heard the uh, movie from uh, Coach Carter. That's the school that I graduated from, but at a different time, obviously. Um, that's why I went for four years before I uh, um, graduated. I, w I did well enough to be admitted to UC Berkeley, uh, 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 becoming one of the first Mian students to be in the university in, in America probably the first one in the UC system. So let me, uh, I can explain a uh, uh, detail. Uh, in that third grade, the teacher was nice, principals was nice. Uh, one of the district, um, probably director or assistant superintendent, she came to our school. She was involved curriculum instruction director, I believe. Um, she got to know my family and then really look after us. But initially it was very difficult, I say, not knowing any English in the classroom as an example. My first assignment, I still remember, it was a very easy assignment to me, I thought. It was a fraction. In Thailand, I knew what a one half meant. I know how to add up to seven digits, right? A multiplication, division, I could do up to seven digits. That, that's the way how they measure how much you know, how many digits you can do. So one half plus one third, all those things seem simple. My first assignment was, okay, one half plus one third, how come they give me such an easy work here? One half plus one third, right? That should be two fifth. So I did all the work, I thought it was easy, I finished it quickly. I got back, nothing but red. Everything was wrong and I couldn't figure out how, why. So it took a long time to learn math. And before I figure out what it was, that you have to find common denominator, the rest. Spelling, again, every Friday they have spelling tests. So I tried my very best to listen to all the words and the teacher uh, enunciation very clearly, but I always got everything wrong. I think there were like 20 words on the board, uh, 10 or 20, I can't remember exactly, but I didn't know that there were words on the board that you have to study. I thought you just have to write what the teacher said. So I did walk time after time after time. I was um, frustrated. I would say demoralized because you were learning with third grade kids to so learn how to draw pictures. I was here teenagers, 15 years, 14 years old, biologically 14 years old. And all the math I couldn't do. So one day I, I tried to listen carefully then I said, those words sound very familiar, similar to the words on the wall. I'm looking at the, I, I, so one day I said, you know what, I'm just gonna try something new. So I would, uh, for that week, I memorized every single words on the wall, on that board, on the sideboard. There's a front board and sideboard. I memorized everything. So it was the time to take the spelling test again on Friday. I just wrote everything down from memory. I got perfect score. And they couldn't, they couldn't believe how I did it. Well, from then on, I was one of the best fellow in the third grade class because I just memorized them. Uh, so it was difficult, um, but that uh, individual who was a district, uh, her name is uh, Miss Bumpo. She's, she, I, still, you know, I still visit her a few years ago, several years ago. But um, she would uh, allow us to call her at night if we had problems with some of the work. Again, our language skills were so minimal, but we just try, had to try our best to understand. She would come to our house to help us sometime. Some, um, she took us to ice creams and sometimes or even to her house. So she was very helpful to us. Uh, but for us, there was no aspiration to become anything more than just to be able to speak English, write, and to get a job that's in an office so you would not have to endure the burn from the sun. That was the extent of our aspiration when we came to this country. Um, I, I guess this is, a, in some way you can see, it's a, the marginalization of the minority in uh, ethnic uh, tribal groups in Southeast Asia really did its 
uh, work in making us thinking that we, are, we were no, no better than just to be able to get a job and survive. We had no other, because no other people had told us that we could do anything else besides that. And in this country, automatically we assumed a second class citizen. We weren't Americans, we weren't Caucasian, it, it wasn't our language. What more could we do? What, what could we do? I would, could never imagine being a teacher or being a principal. That was the farthest thing from my mind. But um, when, I mean, they were very helpful because in the school, only me, my two sisters, and one other Korean, we were the only Asian in the whole school. And as you know, in Alabama, it's segregated. All the African-American kids were bus in. Our neighborhood, we happened to be living among the Caucasian kids' uh, neighborhood, so we didn't meet any African-American students after school. And so we, uh, after going fourth and fifth grade, and the sixth grade, again, teachers were very helpful. Every teacher at that school really helped us. Um, math teacher, she found me a job. I mean, I was probably one of the first person to be working, earning salary, I mean, I, I earning wage. She found me a summer job working in the public library as a, uh, to share books and things like that. Uh, at the school there, they also, because I was the oldest one in the school, they actually asked me to be a, in Alabama, they have a junior traffic patrol. Uh, the, all the students come out wearing a uniform to direct traffic in the morning. I was asked to do that, even though I, my language skills was minimal. I guess after half year, I did well enough to, to qualify as a sixth grade. I did that. Um, so, but we, the kids, or my siblings, we really wanted to stay in Alabama. We, it was the first time we felt like we were able to, to, to learn, um, to be free, to live like the way we wanted to live. Uh, people were caring, helpful to us, but for my family, that was a difficult life. Uh, outside your door, it was a completely different world. You, don't, you didn't know anyone else. You couldn't depend on anyone else. Um, so we had to move, and we didn't want to move. So when we left there, um, Ms. Bumpers, the, the person who helped us, um, there were other people to help us too, like the assistant governors, uh, um, also got to know uh, our family because they sponsor one of me and family. So uh, to me, Southern states, they, they were very helpful to us. We understand all those uh, racial issues, but for us, we were new people. We were not a threat to any, anyone. And so most people help us. And we stayed within our house and just to school. We did not venture beyond that. So we didn't encounter anything that pervasively negative. Uh, except one family who um, moved into a neighborhood that were, and they woke up in the morning, the KKK burning cross all over, and they had to move out. That was the extent of our experience involving racism down there. But when we came to uh, California, she, um, one, two, she just said, you're a good boy, um, go to college. Be a good boy, go to college. That's what she said, that's all we remember. and. Again, we, it was strange that our lives uh, came through a uh, different mean. Coming to California after being in this country for only, um, we, kept, we decided to come to California in August 1980, um, um, 1981. That's being in this country for only um, a 20 months, one and a half year, essentially. We decided to drive from Montgomery to Richmond not knowing how, barely knew how to read map. We didn't have GPS, right? A very few, at that time, there's one other family that drove from Michigan to Portland before. They had their own family, but we had three families that want to come here to Richmond by driving. For most of people who know about driving, if you have someone else following you, it's very difficult, especially at five o'clock traffic jam to big city. What we did, we drove through. Uh, along the way, we had accidents, we had some issues, but we managed to come to California here. Uh, after the ex accidents, actually, I became the lead to take the, all three families, being the lead uh, car to take us to Richmond, California here. And we came, when we came here, after the middle school, after they essentially expelled me because when they found out I had a car, 
they say I couldn't be in the middle school, so I had to go to high school. And we're fortunate uh, at the Richmond High School, there were 28 Laotian students there at that time. We went to the counselor. Uh, this must be about October uh, 1981. He asked me if I knew how to speak English or knew, knew, knew how much English I knew. I said, no, I only had only been in this country for a short time. Uh, so he asked me a few other questions, trying to figure out whether I, what class he should assign me to. All, all the kids at the school were ES, in ESL classes. He asked me uh, a few more questions that he put in the class. I didn't know what it was. Then he said, how about your math? Are you good in math? I said, no, um, I, I just know some math. Uh, he asked, again, gave me some mathematical uh, uh, problems, asked me to solve them. After I did that, he gave me classes. So at, later I found out he was, uh, he actually put me in college track, college prep. English was English prep. Math at the time, he put me in pre-algebra. Back then, pre-algebra is considered a college track. So, and then I still didn't know that I was on my way to go to college. I had no idea, but remembering the advice I had from Alabama, I kept on coming to his office say, I want to go to college. His name was Mr. Abreu, uh, the counselor. I said, I want to go to college. So he got real frustrated one day. He said, okay, you have to go to this program. So they signed me up, uh, up give me an application to apply for a, a program called Upward Bound Program. I don't think we have it here, but at Berkeley they have it. I know they have it at UC Davis. From there, that's when I start to learn, get some support. So I was attending school six days a week, uh, basically Saturday school and then evening to go to Berkeley to get help. And summertime, I stay at the dorm for uh, almost a, a month or six weeks. Um, they helped me a lot. I understood college requirements about college through that program, not my own. And it was my junior year when I learned that, oh, to go to the UC system, you had to have at least pre-calculus. And I was only taking geometry. And my grades were well, I mean, were relatively decent. I mean, I was, I would qualify, I would upper, you know, um, what a top group of the, at the school. Uh, but I was in geometry, so I asked a counselor, look, I want to go to UC Berkeley, and I don't have the requirements. So he let me take algebra two and geometry in the same year. And I did okay, I guess I am. Um, so that's after um, high school, I did well with my GPA, and my SAT wasn't that great, but it was decent enough to qualify me, and fortunately they uh, allowed me to uh, give me the the admission allowed me to attend Berkeley. <laughs> they had no idea what I was doing. Only thing they, uh, what they still tell me now is that they said, at night they would see me stay up till two in the morning studying. And sometimes my grandma would come and say, okay, so you have to go sleep, you're staying too late. But for me it was, um, See, interestingly, it's, 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 again, we were from a society that we, um, we had little understanding of the social complexities in this world, how things operate. So again, from a very traditional Asian society, up in the indigenous society, aspiration was not there until actually at Richmond High School, where I noticed that one of the student leader group was a Vietnamese female student. And she does all the morning announcements and things like that. That to me suddenly made me realize that you know what? I wasn't born here. I didn't speak English. This is not my country, but looks like opportunities there. And that's when I <clears throat> began to really study. Prior to that, I only cared about learning English and be able to survive. Again, I didn't know about college, about the college track. I didn't know about things like that, even though I insisted I, I, I needed to go to college, I didn't know what it was. So from then on, I really began to study. I said, you know, opportunity should be open to me too. And to me, I was, 
I was determined after that. I think I really want to be ahead of the game. I study. I can. I play sports too. I mean, I was a as normal average kid uh, as anyone else. Um, but I did study. I studied late uh, until Saturday schools. I try to try to be competitive and really motivate myself to move ahead. My parents, they really didn't know. Um, for most parents at that time, for me and people, the problem is you need to get a job someday that's not out in the field to take, and that's it. And most of my friends at that time, they were married. Because in, in tradition, in our society, in Laos, uh, men, uh, men, women usually marry in the teens. But I was exception in the sense that somehow I figured that I need to go to school. I refused to, I was very unusual mean person. Uh, for people that knew me, they, they also recognized that too, that I was somewhat unusual. But I, I kept up with school and I, I uh, my parents, they would go to adult school. And we were living in, uh, where we were living, it was far from my high school. It was uh, five, six miles away. So in the morning, they would have to get to, from where we were living to Berkeley for the adult school. And so they had to get up early. So at seven in the morning, they would drop me off at my relative's home to wait for the school to open. Then I would go to school. My relative lived across, in an apartment across from uh, Richmond High School. And after school, I would go to their house again to wait for my parents to come back to pick me up at six o'clock. So that was a daily routine. Um, but my parents really, um, they provide for me. Uh, in our house, we, at that time, my uncle moved to live with us. We had three bedroom homes for 13 people. My dad, my mom, and my brother uh, and a sister in one room. My uncle, they had one room. And my, all my other sister, grandparents, live in the garage. Um, again, this, this is not something we had a choice, but it's a struggle we had to overcome. And, but they gave me my own room. That I could not be more thankful for because it was a space that I needed. Um, that's why I studied late. I mean, at night, my grandma still reminds me that, you know, I still remember you seeing your lights at night um, to this day. So um, for me, they provide all the necessity to me. Um, but other than that, they really had no understanding what I was going through or what school meant. Um, after graduating from um, high school, I was admitted to a, a number of universities. I mean, for different programs I seek for, but I decided I need to stay and take care of my family. Um, they were too dependent on me. Uh, again, for me personally, I, um, I've been taking care of the, doing what I could to help the community since 1980, when I came to this country, because even though I was a kid, I, I, I guess I uh, managed to learn English quick enough. Every new family that came to Alabama to resettle there, <coughs> to re resettle in Alabama, I was with my uncle who was working for the USCC to help him to go bring the people to see the doctors, set up the uh, finding houses, all those things. And when I came to California here, it was no different, although my uncle wasn't doing the, working in the same capacity. Uh, relatives, other, uh, me and family needing help with filling our form, buying cars. Um, I continue to do all this stuff, so I, you know, I had to help my own family too, so I decided I, I need to stay home. Sometimes I look back, I'm, I'm not sure how I made it myself, um, because college was uh, difficult. Uh, any college is difficult, but Berkeley, for those of People who have gone there, it's not that easy. I mean, after being in this country for only five years and then go straight to Berkeley, it wasn't easy because on top of that, because my parents were on welfare, I was a teenager. Like any other teenagers, I, I, I want to live a life. That means you have to have money. You, you have to go to prom. You have a car. You have to go out. You go to a movie. You, you want to do things. But and you want to dress nice, I mean, uh, gas. It's hard to get those kind of, uh, live that life. So um, also, I, in my um, senior year, see, because of my experience going to third grade as a 14-year-old, I, 
I, I'm very sociable amongst my, me and friends. But in school, in the classroom, I was probably one of the quietest students. I never ask a question. I never respond. Of all this time, I only four years of high school, I only asked one question to a teacher, algebra teacher. I felt she was friendly enough because she's the type of teacher that talk a lot and really, I asked a question, but she was busy with other kids and some kids were misbehaving, so she yelled back at me very loudly. And ever since, I never asked a single question. All my other teachers always come up with a common, I, I kept all my high school report cards. It's just one thing that I was a very good student, but I need to participate more. That was one comment almost consistently. <clears throat> so in my high school, um, 12th grade, when I figured I was going to go to college, I came to realization that I had to speak. I couldn't figure out how to make myself speak, do public speaking, or ask questions. But I know that in college, you have to do discussions. Somehow I had to speak. so. I forced myself to get a job. At the high school there at that time, being the only me and taking the college bound college prep courses, I was considered to be, you know, doing well. So they asked you to hire me, the school hired me as a tutor in one of the programs. I was touring, I was getting some uh, income from that, but I had to figure a way to talk to the public though. So I found a job in the public library as a receptionist in the front desk. There, I had no choice. Every person that comes through, returning books, checking out, I had to speak to them. So for me, that was the way to do that. So at Berkeley, when I went there, I still needed money, financial aid, and because I didn't know about scholarship, no one told me about scholarship. So I didn't apply for any scholarship, except the Cal Grant, Pell Grant. And so I had to limit it, and in order to, to make ends meet, I kept my two jobs. Uh, um, I would uh, go to school in the morning. Uh, my first semester, I had class from 8 to about 10, and then I would rush back to Richmond High sc School to do tutoring from uh, 11 to about 2. I would rush back to class again from 3 to 5. And well, as soon as I get back home, I would rush to Richmond Public Library to work from 6 to 9. So I was, uh, and then you come home, and then you gotta eat, and then you have to study. And my schedule was so hectic that I was eating a candy bar, sneaker bar. I still remember the candy bar because that was my primary diet and Coke. I survived on that for most of the time. Then um, it was difficult. Um, I, I didn't have any help. I was commuting. None of my me and friends had, could help me. Um, I was on my own and uh, I didn't do so well for a semester. I got straight C's. Uh, I even received a letter of warning that I would be in uh, academic probation if I could not maintain. And so from then, I, but I was fortunate along my life. I think I, I would consider myself lucky. Um, my um, second semester, I met, uh, I was introdu introduced to a, a coordinator for Southeast Asian American Studies. Uh, Southeast Asian Studies. He was coordinator, but he's an anthropologist professor before that. And he was studying and he knew about me and people. So to me, I was um, shockingly surprised. You know, I was only at that time, well, we, we, I, knew I didn't have the statistic to figure out who was at Berkeley at that time, but from what we know at that time, I was the only Laotian, including the Hmong and Mian. I was in Lao. I was the only person there at the university. So I was surprised to know that this person here, stranger, a Caucasian person, know about me and people, right? So I got to know him. We became a very good friend. And uh, he actually took me out there and uh, as a consultant, helping him being a consultant, like I mentioned earlier, to travel around the state to make presentations. And, you know, as a, if you work in a public library and a tour, I was making minimum wage, 325. Later became four, you know, thirty-five. But as a then I became also we were working a lot of court cases. I was introduced to uh, different attorneys where we I work as a consultant and translator. So I was making enough to supplement uh, my needs 
to the point where I could quit both my jobs. I think that really allowed me the time to study because before that I really had little sleep and little time in life. And after that I really was um, able to do more study and then obviously it was, it was reflected in my grades at school where I became decent students again. For other people they have um, option choices in life based on their interest. When I got, uh, I was about to graduate from um, uh, college, I was uncertain what I wanted to do. I was accepted to a uh, you know, pre-med major at the, uh, you see, uh, is it Riverside, I think, or Irvine. And then an uh, um, engineering major at Cal Poly. All this, I, I, I decided not to go. But when to Berkeley, I was uh, undeclared. Um, I ended up majoring Asian, Asian American studies and ethnic studies, but didn't know there was no one to tell me what's out there. That was my interest. I was interested to learn about me and people. Before that, I knew little about me and people, about the struggles of the ethnic minorities and all those issues, understand the complexities in American social makeup, ethnic makeup, and, and the world at large, right? So, I didn't know what I wanted to do really because I was, I, I had no direction. So, my um, this friend of my, Dr. Eric Cristo, he um, uh, he's the one who got me into jobs and taught me public speaking and all those things. He said maybe you should be a teacher. So I took a this CBS, you know, at the, at the as a junior in college. I passed it, so it was good. And after that, I came out, I thought about it, I said, what well, I could go and uh, do some of the job, what job to do. But I thought and thought during my years at Berkeley, said, why is it that I'm the only mean person with a college degree in this whole country? What happened to the rest of the people? I was nobody in my country. I was poor. My family was poor. We were not leader. But here in America, we we're lacking a lot, so I thought maybe I could give something back to the community, uh, helping out. So I said maybe I could try teaching. So I took the test. I I, I started a substitute teaching in Oakland, Unified you know, School District. And one day I was subbing at a school, a uh, middle school, Roosevelt Junior High School, actually. The, the assistant principal of curriculum instruction and saw my name. I, back then, my name was Kauta Sepan. So I said, are you Mian? I said, yes, I am Mian. I said, we have never come across any Mian college graduate. You're the first one. I said, yes, I know. He said, well, you have to uh, teach for us. So they helped me say there was a program called uh, SOS, Student of Sync, back then at the CSU level for people who would work and go to school to get their credentials. So they put me in that program. And I got my teaching credential um, there. And then I was at a nonprofit organization, board of director, and uh, a counselor at Richmond High School, a different counselor found out about me. Also, to, they said they needed me in Richmond, so they recruited me to Richmond High School, where I taught there for six years, coached there, I did many things there. And then I finally got my administrative service credential because along the way, I, as I got to teaching, I, after a few years, I realized that despite my hardest, my best in trying to help my community, my scope of influence was limited to my classroom. Um, I didn't know how to encourage other students, how to be role model, because again, the, at that time, for those people who did any study or understanding of me and among Lao um, refugee experience, gang and things like that, and number of students drop out, those things were extremely high in the uh, early 1990s. Um, and so, but unfortunately, um, after my third year uh, of uh, in uh, in education, my dad had a stroke, become totally dependent. Um, I I had to tend to that, so I I was teaching, but did not have the aspiration to go back to school. It was until 1997, 98 that I said, 
I had to live my life again. So I went back to school, got my administrative service credential, got my master's, and uh, was offered a position at Richmond High School as an administrator. They called dean of students at that time, later became assistant principal at Richmond High. Then I was there for two years during the time when Coach Carter was there. I was the administrator there, strangely. And then um, I went to um, Kennedy High School in Richmond for another year. Then they uh, sent me to middle school where I was uh, vice principal, then the principal in the middle school. And I went to a district office down there as the HR coordinator while recruiting teachers from my district. I met the uh, HR director from Sac City. And after we were done with interviewing, we, we just talked and suddenly we engaged in conversation. He said, wow, you have to come to Sacramento. That's where the Hmong and Mian students are in this country. And you are, you are, there's a, there are a few of pe people like you. And we needed you so, and at that, and then we had more discussions later, and then finally um, we came to term, and I came to Sacramento uh, at uh, Kennedy High School in Richmond, and in Sacramento here as assistant principal, and then later they transferred the whole Kennedy administrative team to Harm Johnson High School um, under the superintendent's priority school um, initiative. Uh, to help that school, so that's why I've been for the past four years. Without the language skills in, in Richmond, my, my mom and dad, uh, they were on welfare, as I mentioned, living primarily on welfare because I have uh, siblings. I have uh, four sisters and a brother. Um, so they were living on welfare. Uh, my grandparents, they were on a social security supplemental income. And to supplement those, my dad and my mom work as a janitors and uh, babysitters. Um, though they were poor, they would never allow us to go hungry. Um, you know, they had always allowed me to have a room of my own. Um, even most trying time in Richmond, to me that was a um, privilege that I had a room where I could study. Uh, fortunately, you know, my sister, all, all my sister also did well. Uh, all my sister have a college degree or are working in some professionals. Um, so that's how they managed to, to provide financial support to my family um, to this day. And, um, but my dad has been disabled for the past 20 years. So it's, that's, that's been a challenge. But during my time in high school, college, they did struggle. They were working, um, being chauffeur, taxi, taking all the kids. But they, um, that's how they, they, they managed um, um, to provide for us. Well, to me, you know, we, as educators, we often treat people as this a mass, a group of people. We have little understanding of their what motivates them, what causes them to be successful. Uh, you know, we're looking at any school in America. They're rich, they're poor, they're homeless, they're struggling kids, on um, every social spectrum, as strata. How is it that some people, under most trying circumstances, still manage to be successful, and somehow they are able to motivate themselves. I think all the educational reform we have had in this country focus on management, school system, curriculum, but we oftentimes as an educator will fail to understand who the students are. The question I would have, you know, for most educators, really why is it that we we, we don't focus enough that so we can provide the support they need to. Because once a kid is motivated, nothing can stop that kid. But how do we figure out what would motivate that kid? In my case, obviously, you know, experience of having to deal with so many things, uh, something, the light just came on, but a counselor who provided the right courses 
a uh, school district director who took interest in my family, a college professor who somehow had interest in me. Yeah, they all were role models or the person who made possible for me. Myself, looking at the other kids, uh, female uh, Asian students who made it, motivated me. But my parents also have, but the school here, we can, how is it that we can engage a family and student so that they will be motivated? Because as soon as we can turn the lights on and the kids are motivated, the rest of them are, are, are really secondary. Your curriculum, you can adjust that. The kids can learn it, no matter what you want them to learn, if they're willing to learn. I often would tell my uh, people that I talk to, alcohol addicts, smokers, you can give them the best possible facility, state of the art, give them the best program with the super guru. If that person's unwilling to quit, it will not be successful. Is that any different from the kids? Probably not much farther because we're human. Human, uh, we, we are social, psychologically make up that way. So we have to figure out a way to convince a child that there is a tomorrow, better tomorrow, and they, they, they want to, need to be motivated. I think that is a question, a challenge that we all have to find a way uh, to work with until we can solve the puzzle, the problem we will continue to have this NCLB, Common Core. Would those things solve all those problems? We look around the world, probably not. It will just come and go. But if we can figure how to motivate them, doesn't matter what, where the curriculum is from Mars or the moon, it will be successful. <laughs>